So <laughs> there's my pal Salim. Yesterday I told you how tough this guy was, how blunt his analysis and, uh, and his message. For most of us in this room, I'd venture is to say, <laughs> snap out of it. Snap out of it. The business you're in is toast. The industry that you're in is toast. In fact, the very concept of the corporation with which you organize yourselves, all of you, it's all toast. And the thing about Salim is he's often right. This is Salim Ismail. <laughs> Thank you, Moses. Clearly, uh, clearly I'm in the role of provocateur here. Uh, how many of you saw uh, yesterday morning session? Can I just see a show of hands? Okay, many of you, excellent, so I can skip through some of the uh, background. Um, the obviously very provocative title, and I want to defend that uh, in a few different ways. Uh, we're seeing a massive decentralization of the world. And today we run the world on a set of very top-down structures, you know, the, uh, corporations, uh, Judeo-Christian religions, the military-industrial complex. And with the rise of Burning Man, the maker movement, the open source movement, cryptocurrencies, we're moving to a much more decentralized archetype in the world. And the stress that we're seeing in the world is the transition from A to B. And what I'll talk about now is in, in this uh, short talk, how do you think about the future of the corporation, a top-down hierarchical pyramid-type structure designed really very well for command and control? And uh, we'll talk about how that decentralizes and where that ends up. But think about the idea that this doesn't just apply to corporation, it applies to every institution, every mechanism where we use top-down governance, this basic same concept applies. Um, maybe my secret superpower is our eight years of leading courses at Singularity University, I can pretty much pretend to speak about anything at this point. Uh, if, I've, if there's a conversation about autonomous cars, we've led that discussion about 80 separate times, same with Bitcoin, same with CRISPR, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there's a set of very fundamental paradigms now hitting uh, this old construct called the corporation. Uh, you heard yesterday from Peter that we're turning the world into abundance. Right? Uh, think about the idea, and I made this comment yesterday, that pretty much for the last few thousand years, if you didn't have scarcity, you didn't have a business. Right? And now we're finding abundance of, of energy, clean water, education, health care. Uh, information used to be scarce, and it's now abundance. Uh, Ronald Coase made this comment, and he wrote this paper in 1937, uh, for which he won the Nobel Prize, making the uh, point that the reason that we have large corporate structures is for two reasons. One, you can lower transaction costs. And by bringing lots of elements into one organizational structure, the lower transaction costs allow us to create a margin, and we can mark that up and sell that externally. You could argue today that's no longer the case. Right. I can, as a startup, I have the same access to resources. Cloud computing was the final barrier that broke, and now pretty much anybody can jump into a legacy environment, apply new thinking, and totally disrupt it. The second, that the point that Ronald made, was you get uh, critical mass. But now that's also not uh, kind of holding, because we can use community, we can use the crowd, we can use AI, and kind of get the same reach that we used to. So the, both of the fundamental constructs that led us to the thesis of why we have a corporation are gone. The, number th the third one I want to drill into is demonetization. Um, this is really fundamental. And, and here's a comment by David Rose, uh, one, of the, one of the godfathers of angel investing, making the point that we've structured ourselves for efficiency and for predictability. All of our organizations and our corporate structures are designed to deliver the same product and service in 100 different locations with standardized backend processes. They're, they're designed to do the same thing. They're not set up for agility, flexibility, or adaptability. Right? And so this is a fundamental structural issue where we have a... Now, his comment is obviously a little bit uh, dramatic, but the heart of it, I think, is absolutely correct. So let's drill into the demonetization side a little bit. So we've, we're now seeing, as if you remember from yesterday, a dozen technologies all doubling in their own pace. Each of them is doubling, but where you get an intersection, you get a whole other multiplier uh, into the picture. The reason cryptocurrencies are fascinating is you're merging crypto and computing. And just that one intersection gives you incredible upside. Here's one way I like to frame what's happening with technology. This is a 700-year uh, overview of the cost of light. 
And you can see it was very, very expensive, then it plateaus for a while, and then literally crashes to near zero as we industrialize the heck out of it. And I want you to pay attention to the shape of that curve, because that's the important part. Expensive plateaus for all, crashes to near zero. Because here's the shape of the curve for DNA sequencing, and you see the very similar shape. Or the shape of the car for solar energy, and you see the very similar shape. And in technology after technology, the cost is crashing to near zero. And this has some interesting implications. Now, as we lift up to, the, uh, to an industry level, here's what happened in the newspaper business. One we, once we fully information enabled it, and went end-to-end -end information based, you see this deflationary cliff suddenly hit a 6x drop in revenues in two years. It is not a gradual uh, slowdown. Here's the music business, and you see a similar thing, a 10x drop in revenues in that industry. Note that it's called the media industry. Right? They're actually trying to sell the physical media because that's the scarcity. But once you have an information-based paradigm, I can go from artist to listener with a YouTube video, all the intermediaries disappear. Uh, this cliff is hitting the TV business right now because media buying is catching up to the fact that very few people are watching ads. I will predict that hits, this hits the car industry in about four to five years. In about four to five years, it will make no sense to buy a combustion engine car, and within about six or seven years, it won't make sense to buy a car at all. Already in Silicon Valley, nobody buys a second car, use Uber uh, to get around. And it speaks to this problem of how hard it is to spot this linear to exponential trend. Uh, Alex made the point about the chessboard. It's all, almost until the last step that you have another doubling and you don't see that coming. And I want to give you some examples of this because this is really fundamentally important. When the Google car first came out 10 years ago, the cost of the LiDAR, the GPS, the radar, the sensors added up to about $200,000 a car. And all the car companies looked at that and said, ah, cute research project, but you'll never commercialize that. So they ignored it. Two years later, it dropped by 50% to $100,000 a car. Two years later, it was $50,000 a car. And still the response was, who will pay $50,000 for all those sensors? We're down below $1,000 a car across the board now for, the, for all the sensors across the car. This uh, LiDAR unit, the light radar that these cars used to navigate six years ago cost $75,000 and it's now down to about $40. Okay. Why? Because there's three or four technologies, each doubling the aggregate effect results in orders of magnitude change. The next version, of course, will be about $10 and it will dematerialize completely into our smartphones the same way we've seen GPS systems do the same thing. And so in area after area, do domain after domain, the cost is literally disappearing. Um, um, and I showed you this uh, graph of solar energy earlier. It's hard to underestimate or kind of t take care account of the phenomenal implications of this. Right? Uh, in Canada, 40% of exports, I think Diane mentioned this to me, are, are oil. And so as we move to solar, it um, basically threatens the entire basis of the economy. Right? Uh, here's the leading solar expert in the world uh, 15 years ago, basically making this point. In 2003, he makes this comment. And he says, OK, look, if you add up the physical cost of the components, we will never drop below a dollar a watt. That was his comment. You can see the market actually believes him for a little while. Uh, then it starts to drop, keeps dropping, keeps dropping. We're down to about 12 cents a watt today. His latest comment is here at the bottom. OK, this has exceeded my expectations. Okay. Um, <laughs> Peter is fond of saying, an expert in a domain will tell you how you cannot do something. And what we find, where you have an exponential curve, the expert who has 10, 20, 30 years in that domain uh, gets it wrong. And they get it wrong typically by about 10x. This is not a math error. This is a cognitive error. Uh, let me show you this one to really drive it home. This is the growth in the black there. You see the actual growth of solar energy. What you see in the colored lines is the actual predictions at each point of the growth of the, of the experts, the World Energy Organization, saying here's where solar will go. And what you see is that every point on the exponential curve, the experts go linear. In fact, they go down. How do you go down? Who predicts that solar will drop in utilization? Right? How do you get there? And so this is the problem we're dealing with in government, in large corporations, because the legacy thinking can't get their heads around this exponential growth. If you're 30 years in the car industry, you cannot get your head around the fact you have an electric motor car that will go a million miles with no maintenance, no fluids in the car at all. Um, I actually tried to live this myself, because if you're going to kind of talk about this, you have to actually live it. So 18 months ago, I drove a Tesla from Miami all the way up here to Toronto. Uh, the, the, the 
the charging stations are free. It was like having a private train. The car drove itself about 35% of the time using the autonomous mode mechanism. Uh, in December, six months ago, I drove it back. And here are the relative uh, numbers, pretty close because the trip was slightly shorter. But I want to show you the last line here in this, which is the actual amount of self-driving. So when I drove it up, it drove itself about 35% of the time. If it went over a hump, the car would kind of lose itself, et cetera. But when I drove it back, same car, same sensors, now it's driving itself 80% of the time. And the whole trip, by the way, free, because the charging stations are free. Now, where is the money in all of this? The money has disappeared. Right? Now, if I'm trying to think about going down, I'd way rather drive, because it's like having a first-class train cabin. I load up with my favorite shawarma, get about six of them and eat along the way while the car is driving itself. <laughs> it's pretty incredible. Another small example at a personal level, this is our garden. And it's pretty dark at night, uh, so we were thinking, could we put up lights uh, to light it up at night? Got a quote from a contractor, uh, $2,500 to lay the lining, the wiring, the, get the lights on a timer, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so th that was the estimate we were looking at. Except I looked on Amazon and found you could buy these solar lights that are $8.32. And so with no wiring, it even has a motion sensor in it. Uh, for about $32, we light up the garden. Now, the difference between $2,500 and $32 is kind of a big deal, and that money is not getting spent. So we're demonetizing very subtly every single aspect of our lives. And you can see what all the apps being free, et cetera, et cetera, what that's doing. And the reason this is inexorable and unstoppable is the sheer democratization. Because as the costs go up to zero, uh, what we find is you get to uh, zero cost, a domain becomes uh, uh, available to anybody, you get open source communities forming, and then you get radical disruption of the status quo whether it's drones or blockchain or Bitcoin or, or, or biotech or neuroscience, this is what's possible today. Today, any individual with a beginner's mind can enter a legacy environment totally disrupted. It's just a mindset shift. You have the same access to resources and the same access to capability, and everything becomes a variable, variable cost, and now you can scale it. Many of you are familiar with the Hyperloop. Uh, Elon wants to go to LA and to San Francisco in 20 minutes. Um, I was actually chatting with him about this, uh, and I said, Elon, I have a degree in theoretical physics. If you accelerate a human being from zero to 4,000 miles an hour and then decelerate them, you will probably kill them, right? Um, and his answer was, yeah, it's an issue, okay? <laughs> And there you see the exact paradigm, right? Like, I'm like the expert going, wait a minute, you can't, you can't get around this. And he's like, yeah, we have to overcome that issue, right? And the mindset, the mindset is critical because I would stop, I would have stopped. And he's like, nope, keep going. And this is what Peter highlights in his work. We now have entrepreneurs that don't say no. And the answer is actually, now you have to slow down a little bit. I was half correct, but the paradigm, the pattern is here. And what Elon does, his method is really simple. He looks at a technology that's accelerating, looks out 10 years, where will it be in 10 years on this doubling pattern, and then let's build a company to intercept it in 10 years, because it takes about 10 years to build a proper global company. So now here we're seeing this incredible tension in every single one of our corporations globally. We're turning products into services. We're turning brands into experiences. In any corporation, 99% of the conversation is about what's happening inside the company. Very, very little about what's happening on the outside. And what's happening today is the metabolism of the outside world far exceeds the metabolism of our corporations globally. And how do you solve this? Now, we're dealing with one set. We now create tool sets that solve what I call the immune system problem. If you try disruptive innovation in a legacy environment, the antibodies attack you. And we're starting to succeed. But the demonetization, adding up to the fact that transaction costs drop, adding up to the fact that markets are fundamentally shifting, it may be time that we see the end of the concept of the corporation. The question is, where does this go? Right? Where does this go? And I think if you look at the internet, there's an interesting history there. Because if you look on the internet, you saw BlackBerry, Nokia, uh, Yahoo all fail because they failed to become platforms. Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon all successfully became platforms. So you go from a top-down operating company into a platform uh, play. You can see Uber trying as fast as it can to become a platform, adding health, Uber Eats, other mechanisms in there. And then you wire yourself into the ecosystem. You're like a coral reef. And so that's part of one path. The other path is uh, the generation past that will, will start to become ecosystems uh, of interaction with interdependent actors, all operating independently. 
uh, because of this. This is why Google broke up into Alphabet, right? Because if you have a one big operating company, the traditional mindset was that you would get transaction costs and we should use those efficiencies, but you lose flexibility and you lose customer focus because you're constantly spending your time integrating into the mothership. And so this is the enormous challenge. Now, uh, here's a, a, a statistic. Here are 80 CEOs that we bring together every few uh, months. We asked them beforehand, how aware are you of some of these technology breakthroughs? Very little awareness. At the end of this kind of four-day program, 80% agree that these technologies will have a game-changing impact on their industries within two years. And that's the gap that we're trying to bridge. Right? And so fascinating to see. Now, the, what we did was we wrote this book a few years ago, basically look, looking at analyzing this and saying, OK, how is this happening? What is this transition? And we found that we're seeing a completely new breed of organization that is scaling 10 times better, faster, cheaper than its competitors. We are tracking an index of over 100 of these that are operating in a completely new paradigm. Uh, GitHub, some of you saw, got bought last week. No resources, no assets, no workforce, $7.5 billion. So you want to build one of these. You don't want to be in the legacy environment. And so every corporation in the world now has to figure out how to juxtapose with this, because there are disruptive startups. And here's the secret to what's happening. If you think about a business, you're worried about demand and supply. And very specifically, what's the cost of demand, what's the cost of supply? Right? Now, what happened on the internet uh, when it first came out was the cost of demand dropped. We could do online marketing, referral marketing, uh, uh, viral loops, which was the holy grail, and you could drop the cost of demand very substantially, almost to near zero. Every Silicon Valley startup is trying to get the holy grail of a viral loop. What these exponential organizations have figured out is how do you drop the cost of supply exponentially? So uh, the marginal cost for Airbnb to add a hotel room to their inventory is almost zero. If you're Hyatt, you have to build a whole hotel. The marginal cost of adding a node onto Bitcoin is almost zero. The marginal cost of delivering money now is almost zero. And if you have no marginal cost of supply, you take out the denominator, your market cap explodes. That's why the valuations are so high. And so this is not fixable in a structural way. You can, today, we try and do market capture. We try and do regulatory and other ways to try and solve it. Uh, not really fixable or in other ways. So we're seeing a really fundamental pa pattern here. And now we're going to see the emergence of DAOs, distributed autonomous organizations. So imagine I wanted to run a poker gambling website. I could basically set up the website, have the transactions and revenue all programmatically generated, collect revenue with cryptocurrency, and it doesn't have to have a physical domicile. And this is what we're going to see in this next generation. Therefore, you take out all of the costs of the running the entire organization. And so as we can program those transactions, which is the answer to the question Moses was asking earlier, how do you make sure it gets there? You can program the money. And this is the most powerful aspect of cryptocurrencies, not the fact that it's digital, the fact that I can program it. So if I buy your jacket, it puts, takes my money, puts it in escrow, only after I sign for a receipt does it release the money to you. And the, you don't need a middleman to do that. And so this is what will happen over the next few years. Uh, we're, I'm projecting out it for a bit, but we're going to start to see this happen already in the next few months to years, the first emergence of these. So watch for that if you're in a traditional corporation and re-architect yourself into a platform as fast as you can. And if you've got legacy thinkers that think they want to control things in the old way, run the other way. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, let me go this way. Thank you. These guys, you know, they say that the uh, new paradigm is uh, global and uh, exponential. And uh, <laughs> I've always loved the local and the linear. So uh, maybe you can you'll come have it by both. and you give can, us. You can have it all. Yes. Yes. You will come and show me how to get you. there from here. You're doing a pretty damn good job already. That's great, Celine. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Wait, let's get our picture. Oh, yeah. <laughs>